after I graduated from college, my best friend called me up and asked me if I'd like to go on a long expedition in the Canadian Arctic. I couldn't think of a reason why anyone would do something like that, but I also couldn't think of a reason why I shouldn't. So eventually, after several calls, I said yes. The expedition took us high into the Canadian Barrens, north of tree, of tree line, traveling by and with canoes for 1,260 miles. We saw wolves, Arctic fox, caribou, muskox. We experienced 24-hour daylight, beauty, and insane northern lights. And we saw no other people for 77 days. But we did see evidence of resource extraction as we traveled through the Arctic tundra, evidence of mining claims, flags left by geologists, campsites they'd occupied, distant uranium mines, markers for rare earth metal extraction. Our trip ended in the tiny community of Baker Lake, an Inuit community of about 1,200 people. Has no roads in or out, you arrive either by plane or as we did by boat. As you can imagine, a group of eight random people showing up in this town was a bit of an event, and we had to wait a little while to get a commercial flight out of Baker Lake. So we spent eight days or so hanging out in Baker Lake and listening and talking to people. I asked a lot of questions about what it was like to live there, and I learned a lot. One of the things that I learned was that the people in Baker Lake were experiencing climate change in real time, and it was affecting everything. It was affecting their identity, it was affecting how they gathered food on their landscape, it was affecting how they traveled, it was changing in ways that they could observe having been there for 10,000 years. And it occurred to me that the people of Baker Lake weren't responsible for climate change. They weren't the ones who were disproportionately consuming resources. I was. I am at the other end of the supply chain of rare earth minerals, gasoline, oil, diamonds, uranium. And it made me feel awakened, activated. I had to do something but I didn't know what it was. I had to leverage my privilege, having recently graduated from Dartmouth. So I did what any self-respecting creative writing and English literature major would do. I went back to school. <laughs> and I went to the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies to learn about climate change. Way to go, FES. <laughs> and to try to understand what I had seen in the Arctic. The more I learned, the more overwhelmed I felt. It was clear to me that climate change was the problem of our time, but we weren't doing enough. It was a critical problem, and it felt like the waters were rising, literally and figuratively. The more I learned about policy, the food system, environmental justice and injustice, the more I felt like I really had to do something big to stop this. But most of the time, I feel like a little ant just clinging to the side of the planet, trying not to get flung off. How was I supposed to create change on this kind of scale? I spent a lot of time thinking about people who had effectively created massive change. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa. How would I be one of them? One day I went to the print shop to pick up my course packet. At the time, that was how you got information. And um, I was waiting for my course packet to be printed. And while I was waiting, I noticed that on a counter nearby, there were stacks of little business cards. And they were printed with the following saying, we cannot all do great things, but all of us can do little things with great love. A quote from Mother Teresa. I picked one up and put it in my back pocket, and it's been with me ever since. It's actually on the bulletin board in my office right now. When I read those words, I had this sudden realization. Mother Teresa hadn't set out to be Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa had set out to help one person in dire circumstances. Then she helped another. Then she helped another. Then she helped 10. Then people were inspired by her coming to people's aid and they helped her. Then it was hundreds, thousands, now tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. But she didn't start off trying to change the world. She started off trying to do what was right in front of her. So I spent my graduate research, the summers during graduate school, in Alaska. 
And I went there with high hopes. I decided I was going to pursue environmental education. Because obviously, if everyone knew about climate change, they would do something. So I had to educate as many people as possible. I went to work for a small Native American nonprofit, developing an education program and guiding rafting trips, which is a nice benefit. And I asked a lot of people in this small town what the biggest environmental problems were. And I was surprised that they didn't say, you know what we need? We need more people like you to come here and tell us what to do. That wasn't what they said. <laughs> I know, it was shocking for me. <laughs> what they said was, we have an energy problem in our town. Our town runs on a diesel generator. We're not connected to the grid. Energy is fantastically expensive. We also have a local pollution problem. I don't know about you, but I enjoy eating salmon. And it turns out that when you eat salmon, you mostly just eat the filet, right? So the head, the guts, the fins, everything that's not the filet is ground up and dumped into the ocean near where that fish is caught. Not a problem on a small scale, but in a community like Cordova, Alaska, where hundreds of thousands of pounds of salmon are caught every year, this is a massive local environmental problem. So their second environmental problem was a problem of local pollution. When I came back to the forestry school, I started working on trying to use one problem to solve the other. We developed a business plan to take waste from the salmon processing plants and turn it into biodiesel for the generators. And that taught me a lot about the energy sector. I started to get really excited. I became passionate about the issue of energy. It felt like this was going to be a huge issue in the next 50 years. And it felt like something I could really hang my weight on. It matters in part because energy, it turns out, makes people's lives better. This is a graph of the social progress indicator against access to energy in liters per oil equivalent per person per day. You can see that as people get access to energy, their quality of life actually improves. I'm not talking about energy the way we might think about energy, to power our cell phone or to pl play computer games. I'm talking about energy to do things like take goods to market, keep medicines cold, run a ventilator. That kind of energy transforms life. So energy can make people's lives better. And energy is a massive opportunity. This is a Sankey diagram of US energy consumption. On the left are our source energies. They pass through our economy, and on the right is the breakdown of how we use them. You'll notice that 37% of energy is consumed doing useful work, providing energy services. 67% is rejected. Rejected energy is wasted energy. Think about that for a second. That's crazy bonkers. That means that 67% of the energy in the source fuels is rejected, wasted in the system. Now, some of that is hard to capture, but some of it's really easy to capture. So that's a massive opportunity, a massive opportunity to make a living, a massive opportunity to make a difference. And I felt like I finally had my lever, something that fired me up. Now I needed to go and find the place to yank on that lever. So I went to one of the biggest energy markets in the world, New York City. I went to work for a company that was using renewable energy as a way to help companies manage the cost and risk associated with purchasing energy. And it felt like we were doing big deals, we were getting change done, but I was kind of miserable. To me, New York City was sort of like Mars. I feel like people basically break into two camps. Either New York City charges their battery, or New York City drains them, and New York City drains me. I felt like I had this lever but the fulcrum wasn't working. I needed to be in a place where I could recharge, a place where I could connect with nature. I also wanted to live with my work. I wanted to know that the decisions I was making in my workplace were also decisions that were being made in my community. So I came back to Dartmouth to work at this scale, for this to be my fulcrum. And I finally felt like I had the pieces. In the sustainability office, our mission is to challenge and empower Dartmouth and our students to solve the human and environmental problems presented by a rapidly changing planet. I came back to Dartmouth in part because I like a challenge, and at the time, on sustainability, to be honest, we were kind of back half of the middle of the pack. And I don't know about you, but I have yet to have a day where I wake up and say, you know what I'd like to be? Meh, kind of back half of the middle of the pack. No, I want to lead, right? 
I want Dartmouth to lead. So it, one of our major environmental impacts is our energy consumption. It turns out, like everywhere, we are a microcosm of the world. Fortunately, we have some extremely ambitious goals. Goals that align with what the best available science says we have to do to avert the worst climate change. An 80% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2050, and a 50% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2025. Most of our greenhouse gas emissions are generated here. This is Dartmouth's cogeneration plant. It was built in 1896. It was cutting edge in 1896. Unfortunately, we pretty much do things the same way today. 3.8 million gallons of number six fuel oil arrive in our plant. That number six fuel oil is burned, heats water into steam. That steam then runs into uh, steam turbines, and electricity and steam come out to heat and power our campus. Now, we've done an awful lot to improve things. We've fixed leaking valves, improved uh, infrastructure in our buildings, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. We tend to think of buildings as these inanimate objects, the box that we drew in sixth grade. But it turns out they're actually much more like a car. They need to be tuned and cared for in order to perform at their best. And doing that and replacing old buildings with new, much more energy efficient buildings has changed things here at Dartmouth. Our square footage has grown by 19%, but our energy consumption has dropped by 24%. A major accomplishment. There's a lot more we can do. And we're Dartmouth, so we can do this. How are we going to do it? Much the same way we'd eat this delicious pie. We're going to do it one piece at a time. We have to figure out what are the appropriate wedges for Dartmouth. A first and very important wedge is to look at how we move heat around our campus. We can be much more efficient. I showed this picture to my colleague at Princeton, and she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you guys have heated sidewalks at Dartmouth. <laughs> it's like, the problem is that's not a sidewalk. Yeah, so that's an old steam pipe going under Dartmouth's campus, and we have a lot of those. 30% of our steam infrastructure is greater than 50 years old. So we can replace that steam infrastructure. We could replace it with exactly the same thing, but we can gain a much greater efficiency by transitioning from using steam to distribute heat on our campus to using hot water to distribute heat on our campus. That's the first and most important thing we do. By doing that, we'll get a 20% improvement in our efficiency, and whatever we use to generate that heat, we'll have to use a lot less of it. It also makes us much more flexible because generating low temperature hot water is much easier than generating high temperature steam. So you can use things like solar thermal or electric heat pumps. Next, we have to think about the fuel we use. You may have noticed that Dartmouth is surrounded by trees. Our solution should be based on where we are. At Cornell, they have lakes. They use lake heating and cooling. At Arizona State University, they use lots of solar because they have a summer peaking demand and a lot of sun. Here at Dartmouth, we're surrounded by trees. We have a winter peaking system, which means we need more heat than anything else. So in the short term, we plan to switch to using biomass as a source of our energy, wood chips from sustainable local forests. Now, that's going to improve things a lot, taking us from 55% efficient to 89% efficient, much better than the national average. But it is nowhere near enough. If we simply switch to wood chips and stop, we're only doing a tiny percentage of the work. This is what we think things will look like in 2025, but I think an important question is, how will we transition from this to a zero combustion future? A future where we're all electric. What are the next wedges of this pie? How green can we make those wedges? I realize that Dartmouth and Hanover, New Hampshire are not the biggest places on the map, but we are on the map. You could certainly argue that bending the arc of the trajectory of an elite institution slightly more towards sustainability is not exactly earth shattering nor will it change the world. Bending the arc of the trajectory of all of the students who attend Dartmouth slightly more towards sustainability, well, there we might have a little more impact. Whether it's fair or not fair, Dartmouth students will disproportionately impact the world. They'll disproportionately be governors and senators and policymakers. They'll disproportionately use three times more than the, the average global citizen uses in energy resources themselves. So maybe bending the arc of that trajectory has impact. My thing is pretty little, 
but it is the thing that is in front of me. And it seems to me that if anything is a living bridge, it's our planet. It was shepherded by our ancestors, it's being stewarded by us now, and it will be stewarded by our children. I'm doing my best to do my little thing. Some days my best sort of stinks. I drive a minivan. And sometimes I take a plastic straw. It's true. But the next day, I still get up and I try to do my best again. And when I just think I can't, I think about my three daughters. Because they're the ones that are going to inherit this world. And in 2100, when climate models say things are going to be really bad, they're still going to be here. So even though my best is not very good some days, it's the best I've got. And I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to hang my weight from my lever with everything I've got, even on the days when that's not very much. The number one question I get asked when I tell people that I'm the director of sustainability at Dartmouth is not how will we stop climate change or what are we going to do to save the planet, it's should I take paper or plastic? <laughs> and sometimes that's really frustrating because really, like we're facing a potential apocalypse, paper or plastic, but this is our reality. And the answer to that question, by the way, is it depends. It depends on how the paper was made, where the paper came from, where you are. It depends on how the plastic is made. It depends on what you're going to do with it afterwards. And that's complicated. Of course, you should always take your own bag, preferably one that's going to biodegrade before you do, but it's a complicated question with a complicated answer. And it's the thing that people think of when they think of sustainability. It seems to me that just sustaining things is not what we want. I don't want the world to just sustain. I want it to get better. I want it to thrive. So we need to not just bring our own bag. We need to not be paralyzed by whether we should or shouldn't take a plastic straw in this circumstance. We need to try every day to do the best we can on those things, and we need to do the big things. We need carbon capture and sequestration, and we need to transition our economy to renewables. We need climate justice, and we need people to use less plastic straws. We need all the things. Most importantly, we need your things. This is your slide. On this slide, I want you to imagine the thing that you care about the most. Maybe it's your children or grandchildren. Maybe it's your best friend or your team. Maybe it's your puppy. Maybe it's the most beautiful place that you go to when you need to recharge. That's what goes on this slide. When you feel like there's nothing you can do, that's when you get up, double down, and do the something that's in front of you. Do something. Find your little thing and do it with great love. Thank you.